retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. Welcome to the interview room, everybody. So great to see you here on this Sunday night. Got to have this music on. We got Dr. Gary Bracato back with us, author of The New Evil. Let me tell you, a big thank you always to our mods, Miss Sophia, Mimi J2, Maui Girl, and Teresa M. Thank you, ladies, for all that you do. Thank you, every one of our subscribers, every one of us. Every one of you that follow us here on this channel, our aim is to uh, give you update, true analysis of true crime. Thank you to our subs, our members, and our Patreon members. And if this is the first time you're here with us, you're in for a treat, and we welcome you tonight. We only ask one thing, that you hit that subscribe button, hit that share button, and then go buy Dr. Bricado's book, The New Evil, on Amazon. He's the number one bestseller uh, on Amazon in that book, so take take care of it. Tonight, we want to welcome Dr. Gary back. Dr. Gary Bricado, in my opinion, is one of the brightest minds in forensic psychology in the United States, and quite frankly, in the world. Gary is a visiting scholar at Boston College, where he collaborates with Dr. Ann Burgess and Victor Petreca on forensic research. They have examined together crimes such as murder, including serial killing, sex offenses, mutilation and dismemberments, and insanity defenses. And as you can tell tonight, we're going to take a look of Ridgeway and Hurman. So Gary is currently uh, serving as a consultant on a grant-funded project by Burgess and Petreca, analyzing murders involving asphyxiation by strangulation and other means. So basically what that means is this guy is right up his alley uh, and has been for many, many years. He studies, among other things, how violence, thoughts, and actions emerge in psychotic and and non-psychotic personnel. Uh, He's also the co-author of the Columbia University Mass Murder Database, Database, which is the largest database in the world. Gary is extremely humble. I've known him, you know, till I've listened to him uh, talk. And of course, here on our channel lecture, he's also a member of the Cold Case Foundation. And he's the co-author of The New Evil, Understanding the Emergence of Modern Violent Crime. We have his link to his books, as well as his bio, which is the short bio below. When you get a chance, go check it out. And tonight, you uh, in our chat and our members here are going to have some opportunity to talk to Gary one-on-one. And that's what I love about him. He's open to anybody that has questions. So tonight, we're going to do a deep dive. We're going to talk about not only the uh, Gilgo Beach murders, but uh, also uh, a serial killer that is close and dear to Dr. Bricado's heart. In fact, he called it when he mentioned that the Long Island killer is going to be much more like Gary Ridgway. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Uh, there's a lot of discussion going around that, no, it's Dennis Rader, it's, you know, this. No, uh, I think I'm going to stick to the thoughts 
that this is going to be closer to Ridgeway as well as Dr. Bricado's opinion behind the scenes. He's talked about it as well as another individual uh, who likes to put people underneath his house uh, and, and dress up as a clown. Uh, but he's Dr. Gary. We got him here first and foremost, as always. Uh, Gary, welcome to the program again. Thank you so much, by the way, for your time. Thank you very much. And I, I will say, um, even before we jump in, that I, I really want to give a special thank you to my assistant, um, Angel Sendlowski. She um, was very instrumental in putting together some data, some information to kind of help us make a comparison uh, between Rex Hoyerman and, and uh, Gary Ridgway. And we'll see that um, she made this very useful table, which is going to be in one of the slides we're going to talk about today. Um, which gives us an idea of um, when Ridgway was killing vis-a-vis -vis, um, his marriages, which I think is going to turn out to be an important piece of information when we think about Hoyerman. So I do definitely want to give her a, a big thank you. Uh, it was really a lot of work. Absolutely. And and by the way, everybody, you're going to see a slide tonight. And what I'll do is try to make that slide into a PDF and I'll put it under our community post uh, at the end so that people can get a closer view at, view of it because sometimes the PowerPoint shrinks it down, especially through StreamYard uh, that I use here for um, broadcasting, but we don't want to miss it. So um, that said, Gary, are, are you are you ready to talk You're about two? To talk about two? I think we have a feedback. You may have a, a link open, Gary. A link open, Gary. Oh, uh, I don't, That's okay. but, but I can That's mute okay. whenever I'm not talking. No, that, it's not a problem. It's, I'm just getting feedback, but it, it may not be you. So, um, Okay, so we've got Hurriman, Rex Hurriman, Gary Ridgway. You were the first after, you know, we talked. Uh, you were the first to say you, Greg, and uh, were talking about similarities in relationship to what you were initially learning about this guy, but you pegged him uh, right from the get-go. So share with us some of your initial some thoughts, your initial thoughts. Uh, between these two guys. And I'm still, I think you have a a tab open. Do you want to check your tabs? Let me take a look. Let me take a look. I'm going to close the any YouTube other tab window if you have got. YouTube. Oh, he just, he just left this. But he'll, he'll be back here in a second. Um. And by the way, if you're new with us uh, for the first time here, we welcome you. We're so grateful uh, that you're here. We have it, uh, our, the chat set on uh, subscribers. So uh, if you get a chance, you know, jump in there and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, there he comes. He's right back with us. But I closed all the tabs, so hopefully that uh, got rid of the loop. That, that did it. That did it. It's gone. Oh. But, but I blipped out myself. But okay, so you want me to start by giving a little bit of a comparison between these two guys? Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, in their private lives, you know, Ridgeway and um, Hoyerman, remember, it is important that we emphasize that Hoyerman is only an accused killer. Um, but um, in their private lives, these are both people who, first and foremost, were able to maintain work uh, for a long stretch of time and were considered good at their jobs, but um, extremely meticulous, uh, and that were both considered by their co-workers to be very good, but odd, odd people. And um, the, the, the other thing is, in both cases, um, you know, we get the sense of them having been people who were kind of picked on, uh, that weren't particularly popular uh, people socially uh, in adolescence. And what winds up happening in the case of Ridgway is that Ridgway, remember that the the average age at which a serial killer offends is about 26. And um, Ridgway doesn't start until he's 32. And if we look um, and, you know, and we'll in a few minutes, we'll have a chart up of the dates of when um, the offenses happened. But you get the sense of somebody who once he started went on a spree. Right. So so there's a very rapid progression where for several months he there are women disappearing several times a month in 1982 right july august september october so he's on this this kind of spree 
And what he's doing is bringing prostitutes home and playing out some kind of hatred toward women that really had its origins in his relationship with his mother, uh, whom he found to be very emasculating and humiliating. Um, he brings them basically home. And um, there is a murder essentially by ligature strangulation, sometimes manual. And this constituted, you know, and it's a strange term, but it constitutes a kind of a low grade torture. In other words, the, 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 it was a, there would have been a protraction of the murder process through this slow process of strangulation. So there's a little bit of a, a sadism that plays out there. And then once they're killed, he takes them in a truck. Um, and essentially dumps them in a, in an area that um, is surrounded by water where there are a lot of reeds and weaves and things like that. Now, one of the, the, um, the, the, the thing that's interesting about that is that he was going back and having relations with the bodies sometimes because he was also very attracted to this totally passive figure that kind of, that he had total control over and that couldn't, do anything other than lay there and um but he got a little sickened by it and stopped doing it this is very important because when they were hunting for the green river killer when they were hunting for who turned out to be ridgeway um they went to ted bundy uh to ask for advice and ted bundy suggested that they should they were looking for a necrophile now the reason i mention this is because i had said the last time i appeared with dr burgess on this show that I was very interested in the doll, the effigy that he was keeping in that kind of casket-like thing, because I have found in my research that there is a relationship between people who keep mannequins or dolls that are used sexually, which may have been going on there, and necrophilia, that it is can be a, a similar thing psychologically, because it's the idea is, is that it's a totally passive anatomical thing that you can experiment with and do things with um the other thing that is in common between the two of them is that they were both splitters they were both people who had wives that would be pretty shocked at what was going on uh and and women that i think kind of bound them together uh especially uh, during one of the three marriages ridgeway has we see that there's virtually no killing uh and uh, the pattern with ridgeway suggests that having a woman in his life who was different than the kind of unpredictable abusive mother that he reportedly had um, was very corrective for him and acted as a kind of a glue that would keep him from going out and acting out this murderous need. With Hoyerman, what's interesting is that it looks like um, the wife is out of town whenever he goes out and does things. And what's arising rapidly is really two hypotheses. Uh, and I think it's going to be really interesting to see which one turns out to be true if he is guilty. So one hypothesis is that he was plotting and scheming to commit a murder if he is indeed guilty and would need to get the wife out of town. Right. Like I'm in the mood to do this. I've got to get my wife away. Um, and there is some evidence of that because of all the planning that we see. Right. Getting the burner phone and et cetera. The other hypothesis is that this happened because she went away, that because she went away, it unraveled him. And he and, and he had too hard of a time with that, suggesting perhaps that abandonment by a woman might have some significance for him that could be traumatic or activating. Now, the other thing that I, I think we're going to have to get into with Hormon that has not really been talked about yet is that I am increasingly convinced, Chris, and I think it's worthy of a whole conversation, that... Um, the death of his father is going to turn out to be like a linchpin in this whole story. And um, and I hope we'll get to touch on that. But I, but I'm not bringing it up as a comparison with Ridgeway, but I just think we have to touch on it. Um, yeah, so but, let's, um, yeah. Let, let's do that. Yeah. But let's let's go over it because you I know how your mind goes at, at a thousand miles an hour. And I love you know me. I love you. You're not, you're not kidding. And I know the audience does, too. But. So let's just talk, you know, just we got a couple of things that, you know, comparisons, right? Uh, going back to uh, Ridgeway for a second, 49 women, King County, 82 to 98. Five, uh, initial five were manual um, asphyxiation, strangulation, but they were dumped into the water. And thus, that's how he gets his name, uh, the Green River Killer. And then he started killing 
um, sex workers at about 33 for about 16 years. And he was arrested leaving his job at a truck factory. So the question that I have here is obviously you had made a comment about his IQ at that time. Tell everybody a little bit about, you know, how smart um, Gary was, Ridgeway. So, so one of the interesting things about Ridgeway is, is that it is estimated that his IQ is borderline. So, so that he is, this is not somebody that would be like low normal, but would be a step below a normal individual in terms of intellect. And um, the 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 suspect, Hoyerman, Hoyerman, I would think, is somebody who has an above average intellect, particularly given his work and so forth. The trouble is that I have never seen any compelling evidence one way or another that that is true about the IQ of Ridgeway. Um, and, um, you know, but the kind of work he did and the, the lifestyle he had, it's kind of difficult to tell. We don't have any corroborating evidence. But I do think that it, there is a certain intelligence necessary to get away with what he was doing for a long time. Remember, Ridgeway was really only caught because of DNA, which is another um, commonality that these cases have, is, is that they were clever enough to conceal these offenses. And, uh, and there are a couple of things that, that you know, other than the IQ that, that are interesting to raise in terms of what might be different about them. Uh, 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 for example, um, Gary Ridgway was not somebody who was interested in, uh, in insinuating himself, like calling up family members and, and trying to, you know, kind of mock them or ridicule them. And that's something of which uh, there is uh, an accusation with Hoyerman. And um, also with, you know, with Ridgeway, the, the ages of the, the victims are kind of all over the map. But the ones that are minors would make him more like a hebophile. They were teenagers, but they were like close to age of consent teenagers. Um, but with um, Hoyerman, there's no accusation of him actually doing anything with a child. But the Internet searches suggest a sexual attraction or an interest in um, at least children as young as 10. Uh, so that's a difference between them two. But I think that age thing is going to come in when we talk a little bit about what might have gone on with the father and in the family life. So let's shelve that for a moment. Okay. So do you think, though, be, you know, comparatively, you know, apples to oranges here, the intelligence level of this guy versus the intelligence level of, you know, allegedly the guy now in Long Island, do you think that's going to play a role here? Uh, ultimately, because it looks like, I mean, his body count uh, was 48. I mean, and that's what they thought, right? I mean, back in the day, uh, it could go as they initially, some of the investigators thought it went as high as almost 90, 80 or, 80 or 90, right? Am I right there, if I remember right? Yes, and there are, and there, he confessed to a 49th, and there is a, um, there, there are other victims in the Green River killer case that have never been attributed to anyone. Uh, so he may have been well into the 50s, if not more. And this is very notable because in men who commit serial sexual homicide, which is what Ridgway was certainly doing and what Hormon is uh, suspected of having done, um, particularly ones who are kind of engaging in a, at least a low grade kind of torture where there is this playing out of a fantasy that has to keep being perfected over and over again. And you're kind of angry at women generally and so forth. What you tend to see are very large victim counts, uh, and um, Ridge, you know Ridgeway was kind of going across state lines, so that it was originally difficult to attribute cases to him. This is something else that I suspect is going to be investigated, you know, more and more with Hoyerman is the possibility that he was kind of running around to different locations and had a couple of collections potentially of bodies, um, but but this is the kind of person who would cluster bodies together in given areas like little collections and um but but i think if it turns out that hermann is guilty what you would expect is he probably didn't only kill you know four people of whom he's currently being being, being uh, accused um uh and um it certainly may even be something like double digits or higher the average as i said on the last program is about 12 for offenders of this type and I wouldn't be shocked um, if it turns out that they start looking at lots of cold cases potentially being tied to him and the number just kind of goes up. Otherwise, what we have is a really weird anomaly where somebody would have started in his 40s and then just sort of petered out 
And, you know, you remember, of course, it's in the news as we speak that it's been discovered that this guy invested a lot of money, I guess, in constructing a soundproof room in his basement um, where it's suspected now. And we, you know, Ann and I had said we thought this was happening at home, um, that he was probably killing them there. And I mean, how many people would build a soundproof room in the basement for that few victims and for only a limited amount of time? I mean, chances are it was a kind of torture chamber uh, yeah. or a place where he would bring them. And there are other serial killers that have done that. Uh, David Parker Ray, for example, uh, um, uh, Robert Ben Rhodes and people like that who would construct a, a kind of a place where you brought people where there was soundproofing and there were instruments around and things like that. And you could do whatever you wanted. Um, we don't actually know for sure, Chris, because the bodies are kind of decomposed badly and everything. We don't know about like torture markings and evidence of what was happening to them. But you could make a pretty educated guess based on uh, the sadism glimpsed in his pornography. Um, the fact that these women were bound, um, buckles, ligature, so forth. And, um, and the fact that there was a soundproof room, that there was some at least low-grade torture uh, going on there. Interesting. So let's, uh, this is your assistant's uh, chart. So let's, uh, and give her, give her a shout out again, because she did an amazing job here. Go ahead. She's an up and comer, I think, in, in the, in the world of uh, forensics. So, but uh, her name is Angel Sedlowski and uh, she made this, this fantastic chart that lays out all 49 victims of Ridgeway and what it does is it, first of all, we see the ages. So as I mentioned, they're sort of all over the place, but some of them are minors, as you could see. Um, and then what you see there is the dates of disappearance. So here we have the, the ability to lay out that this is a, this was a spree killer originally, right? This is a spree killer who went on to be a serial killer, right? So we had this period where he's just going buck wild uh, in 1982, July, August, September, October, no cooling off period. Right. And um, what's important about this is if you look at this carefully, none of this killing occurs when he is married. He had three marriages. And what it looks like is when he is single, he's off to the races. Right. It, it sets him off. And um, it looks like the marriage that came later was particularly good at binding him in terms of not going out and killing. Now, with Hoyerman, this is very interesting because. Hermann was single, the best that uh, uh, Angela and I can patch together. Um, he was single from 1990 to 1996. And um, that is really interesting because that raises the question, what was going on then? Right now, I could tell you in 1990, Hermann would have been 26. Right. 26, 27, excuse me, 27, which places him exactly at the average age when a serial killer starts to kill. That's interesting. interesting. So that that I, if I were involved in this investigation or whatever, one of the things I would strongly be looking at is what was going on in that patch of time when he was alone. And, um, and, and I would not be surprised if we discovered that there were some fledgling offenses and things that were going on there during that six year period. Perhaps he begins to hone a, an MO then he marries someone who binds him together again. And then every time she kind of steps away, we see a reverting, which would explain why these offenses look so organized and professional. That is not how they should look if this was when this guy was first doing this. It looks almost like he rehearsed, practiced it, right? He had done it before. I mean, wouldn't you say, Chris, from an investigation perspective, that's pretty strange. What do you think? Yeah, it, it is. And the, the interesting correlation, no, it is. Uh, and the interesting correlation that you brought up was between when Ridgeway, you know, his first, uh, you know, four or five killings in the water. And then, of course, this situation, if, you know, these four are correlated back to him, the the fact that, you know, there were events and what we call these trigger events, right? There was something that happened you know, and the, uh, early on, and then you go back and you look, and you made an interesting observation, uh, which you shared with me, in relationship to things just kind of stopping in time. 
Uh, and why don't we talk a little bit about what your thoughts were, uh, share with the audience, you know, why you think it's significant uh, that they go back as far as they can, even maybe early adolescence in, in uh -huh. Rex and how they went back with uh, Gary and discovered, you know, some of the stuff. I know you, you said it a minute ago, they, they actually went to Bundy, but I don't know if people caught that. Uh, but with yeah. this one, yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of overlay that you have said. Uh, tell everybody why it's important that that snapshot, that snapshot in time, i.e. the house, is significant. Well, um, first of all, one of the things that is very interesting about Ridgeway that we also see with Bundy is, is that until they went in and really dug up their histories, um, there was this sense that, you know, their first victim was much later in life. And then they went in and learned what really went on. In Bundy's case, there had been a victim when he was much younger, who was a, it's believed uh, she was a, a young teenager who was uh, on his paper route that, that turned up dead. And it's long been believed that that was his first victim. In the case of Ridgeway, when Ridgeway was 16 years old, he stabbed someone and uh, the person didn't die but it's very interesting that that happened at 16 years old and he doesn't actually kill until he's 32 right so i think that's intriguing this idea that people are actually beginning to have these fantasies and this loss of impulse control even in adolescence but then what it looks like is you get these kind of dark years where you don't know what went on and then all of a sudden there's the pattern of killing like out of nowhere it looks like but probably things heat up now with um Hoyerman, what i'm very suspicious of is that the death of his father has an enormous significance the death of his father came when he would have been about between 10 and 11 years old and um one of the things that you know you kind of hear through the grapevine about this case is that part of the reason that Hoyerman might not have wanted to change that house, despite being an architect, change that house that he grew up in so that it's in a shambles and so forth, but he won't change it, is that it's like a kind of a shrine to this father that died. It's like preserved forever. And there are other people that did that. Um, for example, Ed Gein, the serial killer Ed Gein, um, when his mother passed away, sort of walled up the, you know, kind of kept her room exactly the way it was. In fact, in a pathetic attempt to kind of become her, he would make, he was making this woman's suit, right? And kind of talking in her voice and so forth. And um, we see this with Armin Mives, the cannibal in Germany uh, who found a victim on the internet. His mother had passed away from cancer and he walled the room up and kept it as a shrine like that with her wig on a, like a kind of a, on a, on a form that, and then he would kiss it and say good night to it and things like that. So that we have this inability to move on. Now, this phenomenon, um, which we call introjection in psychology is where you make a person part of you, right? A person has died and when they're dead, you, as a matter of fact, um, the audience might be interested in this little tidbit. Freud um, thought that um, when people died, and we had a funeral and then followed it by having a big dinner after the funeral. Freud thought that this mimicked the phenomenon that you see in cannibal culture, where the idea was that somebody dies and to make them part of you, you eat them, right? So the idea was you would introject them into yourself by eating them. And this is the same thing that cannibals like um, Dahmer and other people talk about that the motive for cannibalization was this notion of making somebody permanent by bringing them into you. So they're dead and now I want them to be with me forever. So I eat them, right? So it's a kind of a, a weird way. As a matter of fact, it has a um, analog in the religious concept of like communion, right? So like mm -hmm. the, if you go in mass, they eat the, the Eucharist and it makes Christ part of your body because you're eating him. That's an idea that gets perverted in what some of these serial killers talk about. And the reason I mention it is because these are all attempts at this construct of introjecting, making somebody part of you. And um, when somebody can't do that, they'll do it in a kind of a weird primitive way, like completely denying that the person died, right? Or I will make the entire house a shrine and we're never going to change one object in it because I can't deal with. Now, if that's true, what it suggests is that the death of his father would have been an enormous disempowering 
psychological trauma for this guy. And it makes you wonder, does that mean that being left with his mother figures into this story? Was this something that we don't know yet about that relationship that is important here? Where did he start hating women? And Ridgeway, for example, you know, okay. had a, a, you a get, horrendous there, relationship with his mother. Wait. Yeah. Before you go too far, what so you're thinking right now, and of course it's early, right? It's early, but yeah. your your experience has showed you and, and enough you've talked to enough of these people to where yeah. you're sensing that there's a fixation in time, i.e. the house is frozen, could be correlated to the death of his father, and now he's left over to his mom. Do you think there's yes. issues there between mother and son? Well, we don't know for sure, but something made this guy start resenting women or feeling disempowered. And um, remember in that little biographical sketch, that autobiographical sketch of him on YouTube, he immediately mentions the father teaching him the technical skill of woodworking and all that. We also have this conspicuous thing of him looking at pornography of 10 year olds, same yeah, age, right. just about when he loses the father. Right. So and that doll thing. We don't know how that's going to figure in, but this fixation on that time period, I think, is going to have a significance. It, it has. Okay. Now, think about this. Think about this. There is an accusation that this guy was calling up the family members of victims, taunting them. If this mm -hmm. guy considered losing a family member traumatic, then it would be enormously significant to call up the family members of victims and taunt them because you're saying, I was disempowered by losing somebody, and now you are. I felt weak because of it. Now you feel that way. So that it isn't enough to get revenge on the woman. You've also got to even that you've also got to level the playing field with regard to feeling that you got cheated out of a loved one. And I think that's going to figure into this story in some bizarre way. And this goes right into this idea that getting together with a woman who is stabilizing seems to have prevented this guy from doing anything. Same thing we saw with Ridgeway, right? So I think it's it's th this is all speculation, but for me, it's coming together to be very suspicious that something traumatic happened to this guy between 10 and 11, related to the death of his father, and this idea of exactly like this Gina is saying here on the screen, that it's a kind of a hot potato of pain that you don't want, and you pass on to someone else. You project it onto them, right? And um, the other thing, of course, is, was this guy abused? A lot of sadistic people, like Ridgway, were abused. Ridgway was a bedwetter and was mercilessly humiliated surrounding that, around his yeah. aneuresis. There must have been something humiliating to this guy. We know, Chris, that in adolescence, he was ridiculed for his enormity. They used to call him Hormon Munster because he was so big and weird. Well, what, what did they call him? I think what did they call him? Yeah. Hoyerman Monster. Herman Monster on the Monsters, yeah. the show? The, yeah, yeah, the big, okay. right, because he looked like, you know, Fred Gwynn was gigantic, you know, so they called him Hoyerman okay. Monster. Now imagine being compared to the Frankenstein Monster, but not only the Frankenstein Monster, but a ridiculous comical version of him, uh, you know, and that's really interesting. You know that his size figures in, because look at the, the size of the victims, all 410, things like that. He, he took his weakness and turned it into a uh, a revenge act, right? Wow. You you make fun of my size, so I'll use it to kill you. That kind of thing. Oh, that that is fascinating. Just just that that one sentence alone, how you correlated that so quickly, is absolutely fascinating. Okay, so I want to um, okay keep going uh, about him, and then you know the and here he is. To your point in high school, this is his high school uh, yearbook mm -hmm. picture. So, you know, some people, you know, have called him, you know, as Laurie is, is reporting here that some folks are calling him the lurch kind of concept. Uh, and and then he's now also coming home to a hormone monster. Uh, he's coming home and people at home the mother potentially overbearing could really be letting him have it as well. Right. We don't, we don't know, know, but we do know that he started to have trouble with women in school. And, um, okay. you know, he was considered sort of an oddball. I mean, here's where, 
you almost get little whiffs of Kohlberger, right? Where he would do things that were just off-putting. One story that I heard about him that I thought was very interesting was that there was a woman he liked a lot, and then he created a like a document or a note where there was like a checkbox option, like, and he would say, like, are you interested or not? And then the woman would have to check the box and like stick it back in the locker, right? That that's odd. <laughs> that's the kind of thing that you because you really get a glimpse of a guy who was super technical, right? Technical and and kind of would think in this, you know, exactly the kind of guy that that would probably have enjoyed looking at the little chart we just made, right? A technical yeah. thinker and uh, and who would have enjoyed putting those little pieces together. And um, and I think uh, it is not surprising that he would have, from the time he was a boy, taken this skill that his father taught him, something that he carried over and that made him feel like he had introjected the father, right? Made the father, far, the father part of himself. And that was how he showed masculinity and power. It was that he had this uh, skill with tools. Now, take that piece of information and put it together with the likelihood that this guy is being sadistic with women. And you imagine him feeling like a man, using tools, engaging in torture, et cetera. And you, you totally get the picture of a guy who was trying to put it, stick it to women by being this man that he had had always wanted to kind of live up to, who is, essentially he lost. And uh, I think that's that's my hypothesis. But but we'll see uh, how true that turns out to be as time goes on. Well, everything you've said, I mean, and. I mean, going back to Koberger, I mean, long before they caught him, you nailed that guy. And I mean, he's just one of many that you, you and I know. That's what we you know, do. Been involved right. in. Yeah, it's, right. it's, and, uh, and by the way, if you're just joining us, everybody, uh, in front of you uh, is Dr. Uh, Gary Bracato. Uh, and he is, in my opinion, you know, one of the brightest uh, psychological minds in, in not only in the country, but of course, uh, around the world. He's very well respected in, in his field. He is also uh, the co-author of the Columbia University Mass Murder Database, which is the largest mass murder database in the world. And you were surprised to see that uh, Ridgeway uh, actually, whoops. The Wi-Fi. Yeah, did I lose yeah. you? Yeah, no, no worries. No. You just got to get rid of the second me here. You know, the uh, I'm on the screen twice. Okay, I'm going to kick you from the studio. Stand by. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we, there you go. Right. The Wi Fi blips out, out every here. once in a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you were actually surprised. Um, and welcome to modern technology, right? I mean, it's just we all, we both go to space every once in a while and we, we end up back here. Yeah. Um, but you were actually surprised that Ridgeway uh, initially started off uh, as a spree killer, weren't you? Uh, or was it yeah. was it Rex? No, I, it was I'm, I was very surprised that Ridgeway started out that way. Now, this is the thing, um, Chris. Looking at other offenders is extremely important because these guys do move in a kind of blueprint pattern, and um, one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot is um, the, that there are also some interesting similarities potentially with Gacy. And um, I just want to point out before the thought leaves my head that if you had looked only at the crimes when Gacy was dumping bodies over the side of a bridge, you would not realize that he had way more victims at first that were buried under the house. And one of the things I'm concerned about is that the explanation for the gap in victims, where all of a sudden there's this killing when he's in his 40s, why did it not start earlier? I'm not so sure that he didn't have an original place where they were going, <laughs> and then he ran out of room or, or something like that, right? And of course, today they're excavating, right? Precisely because I'm sure that they're wondering about whether there are bodies elsewhere, even in the home or near the home, right? And uh, so that that with Gacy, it turned out that, you know, remember when they arrested him, he made the quip that all he was guilty of was running a cemetery without a license. Well, you know, because it, he had collected everybody together. He was a collector. This guy is also a collector. And um, so he either has one collection 
or there are going to be multiple collections. It's one or the other. And um, I think right now there's a question mark hovering over, was he a collector who had only one spot? Uh, if so, all right, then there could be as many as 10 victims of, you know, remains that have popped up. But um, but I'm not so sure. So I think it's good that they're going and looking at the house. I think it's a very good idea. Don't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. And and which leads into an interesting thought. There, There's no direct evidence that correlates these dolls, but there's been stuff on Reddit and, you know, a variety of things floating around the internet, which is not substantiated yet, by the way, for the record for everybody. Uh, but I am curious what your thoughts would be if, in fact, these dolls at some point play a role uh, and these are only, you know, somebody put them up on the internet and on Reddit. I saw it. I, you know, I took these two pictures here, but uh, they put them on, it looks like the victim's uh, crosses here. And then they pull that doll out of the house. Do you think there, in any way, shape, or form, uh, there's some messaging going on here, if anything, or is it too early to tell? I think we, we should reserve judgment on this, but it is disturbing when we think about that he had that doll in the house. And when we think about um, how this type of offender, think of Ridgeway, um, has that interest in kind of toying with a body in an experimental way and it may be that he is somebody who was willing to kill an adult victim but played out um some of those fantasies about younger victims um with the with the dolls uh i'm not really sure what the dolls at the graves would mean i have no doubt that this guy would visit where bodies are located uh, and um, what struck me about the dolls, and I don't want to get graphic, so I'm just going to kind of keep this simple. But one of the things that struck me was that cottony kind of stuff that seems to be jutting out of the mouth of one of the victims, because I think with the with the strangulation uh, thing, the size of the bindings, certain things that he was looking up in terms of pornography, it's very clear that the kind of torture or cruelty that this guy played into had a lot to do with the control of a person's breathing. In fact, yeah, Sarah is saying that on the screen right here. Yes. I think that that, that control over the breath, I think, would have a, give a person a very godlike kind of a, a fantasy. I also am very interested to find out how his father died. I would be really curious to find out if it was pulmonary or if it was something that had to do with the breath stopping or whatever. But he has some kind of obsession, it seems, with this idea and um, I, I am very interested in how that played out in the room where he's basically torturing the person by saying, I will be the arbiter of how much breath you have in your mouth, right? I am going to control that and I will be the one who takes it away from you. I think that's what's interesting about that also is that it's so biblical and so is the burlap. The, the, the yeah. burlap thing is biblical because burlap in the Bible is a symbol of somebody being a like a like a prostitute or a, a person that's a sinner or walking around showing regret for their sins mm -hmm. and they were in burlap probably because it, on the practical level it was a camouflage but on another level it's disturbing because you don't know if he was sort of calling them prostitutes and then you take that and you put it alongside the biblical imagery with the breath and it's kind of intriguing and um, with Ridgeway there was an intensely religious preoccupation Ridgeway became one of these you know Kind of born again um, um, uh, figures where he, he was sort of trying to split his life by saying, I won't do those things anymore because now I've discovered God. But the problem is, is that even when he was doing that, he would slip away every once in a while, give in to the crime and then and then come back to the Bible and, and so forth. And uh, but but I think I wouldn't be surprised if we learn that there was there's some reason for that kind of biblical symbolism with this guy. So, yeah. so a vet girl mm -hmm. asked, doctor, why do you change, or why do they change style or evolve into bigger monsters uh, contributes yeah. to change? Wait, go ahead. Well, I think the psychology of that is, first of all, um, you have to remember that the key to the whole thing with these kind of offenders is fantasy. You have a fantasy that you probably start having as a little boy and you get angry at some figure. Right. Whether it's women in your life, your mother, or some other figure, 
you you get angry at them and you start picturing like a lot of kids do, by the way, because I've had a lot of patients who are children who say things like my mom, you know, my mommy gets mad at me. So I like draw a picture of like dropping something on her or which like they or, or my daddy yelled at me. So I I, I imagine like a car hits him because I hate him so much, you know, but they don't really want to do that. They're just mad. Right. So that that you get the image of a person who who is angry, but in their fantasies, they're doing things that are a heck of a lot worse, right? They're they're sometimes sexually assaulting the person, they're ripping them to pieces, they're torturing them, they're screaming at them, they're whatever. And they have to visualize that, whether it's thinking about it when they're getting older and getting into puberty and, and kind of masturbating, or looking at pornography where they're imagining that the pornography is the person they hate or they're making a model or a doll or they're drawing or they're whatever, looking at certain magazines, but they need a visualization of it. And then what happens is some proximal event in their life, some event that pushes them over the edge, something loss of control makes them finally go out and kind of do it. And for some of them, the the crossover is an accident, right? Could, so they'll could say, the loss of the right, mother, yeah. could the loss of a yeah, mother, what effect, what is, what is mother dying have? Well, but I mean, the, the, in this case, it looks that the death of the father was significant. But of course, the death of any parent would be significant if you especially if the person is somebody that you have ambivalent feelings toward. Right. Because, the, the you know, I think of it like this. If you have a parent who is horrible to you and we don't know anything about how that woman was, I have no idea how his mother was. But if you have a parent who is not perfect to you. The idea is always going to be the fantasy. Maybe one day I will get that person to apologize to me or we could make up or maybe I'll get even right in some way. But if they die, you can't do that anymore. The, the, the person is gone right now. You have this anger and you don't have anyone to play it out against. Right. So so that's the whole thing. You we don't know how this figured in right now. It's all speculation. But I think the key to this whole thing is going to be what went on in that house before this guy was even in puberty. And he was he would have been walking around, probably in adolescence, looking for a woman to be kind to him and have a relationship with, weirding women out. And then he finally gets into a marriage and it probably bound him together, it made him happy, you know, for a little while. So but um but but I think the answer to the getting to be a bigger and bigger monster is that the fantasy um has to get more and more per you know, the actions have to be more perfect. You have to keep doing it more and more like a bigger fix, right, to 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 kind of get a thrill, right, so that it isn't enough to choke someone. It isn't enough to peep at them. It isn't you have to kill them. And then when you kill them, you have to torture them and then you have to increase the torture. And then you have so that you become more and more of a monster. And in this guy's case, there would have been more and more of a split. So he's living this double life where he's got this whole thing behind the curtain and then at home, no one would suspect it. Yeah, I, his, I, his mother is. Uh, she may still be. I alive. think so. Yes, I think his mother yeah. is alive and elderly. Well, I have to double check. I think earlier, she's alive. Yeah, and we know nothing been... about her. She may turn out to be a lovely human being. Yeah, we have exactly. no idea. We only know we that know the death of the father died. is conspicuous. Yeah, yeah. Death of the father is very conspicuous. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, everybody, if you're just joining us, also, if you have some questions, I want to, I want to let uh, Dr. Picado start hitting some of these questions here uh, early. Yeah. Let's see here uh because i see a bunch of them coming up and if you have a question please put it up here it says hope g uh are there sexually deprived serial killers able to have normal intimate relationships with their uh spouses do they limit their depra their depravity to their victims or does it extend to their partners this is an excellent question um, in uh, men who commit serial sexual homicide of the splitter variety of the compartmentalized variety what tends to happen is, is that they have a garden variety sex life with the partner and then they go out and they're living this kind of double life where they're doing these very perverse things elsewhere. But what happens is that every once in a while, according to the partners of these people who later turn out to be serial killers, there are glimpses that make them very uncomfortable. For example, Gacy's wife used to discover um, magazines that made it uh, made her suspicious that he was actually attracted to males uh, and um, that and, and she kind of matched that to the fact that he wasn't too interested in her sexually. 
Um, in the case of uh, Dennis Rader, there's this idea that the wife might have kind of walked in on him engaging in autoerotic asphyxiation or kind of wearing an outfit where he was reliving a crime. Um, in the case of Bundy, there was there, there were times that he would request that the romantic partner play dead so that he could play out necrophilic fantasies. Um, in some of the cases uh, I've heard about, uh, for example, um, Gary Heidnick, uh, who was keeping women in the pit in the basement in Philadelphia uh, to try to create a, a, a line of women that were loyal to him because he was sick and tired of being abandoned by his wives. Um, he was being left by women because he was getting too much into the bondage and the S&M stuff. We see that in the case of the serial killer, um, uh, Henry um, Wallace, um, whose wife left him because he was getting too much into the strangulating of her in the bedroom. So there, it, so it starts to spill over. But for, but for most of them, uh, there is an ability to keep it completely split so that the wife will say, when it's all over, the partner will say, what? That guy? He was such a wimp. He was such a he wasn't even particularly sexual, the aggressive. Are you kidding? Like what? That that so that there's like an almost in, an incredible inability to believe that the partner would do this. We saw, by the way, the immediate filing for divorce by uh Rex Herman's wife, um, which suggests, of course, that you know she was completely shocked. Um, so this one know, here. So Dr. Percato, mm -hmm. do you think there's a significance to the Gilgo Beach area? Uh, to RH beyond the obvious, it's so close to the house. Linked to memories, thoughts. I think it has to do with the idea that this kind of offender um, likes to have his handiwork nearby because of his desire for control. Um, but I also think it gets into this whole splitter thing that I'm talking about because there's a story I always tell about Ridgeway. Anytime I bring him up, I tell this. Um, there was an incident in the life of Ridgeway. Some of you have heard me tell this before. There's an incident in the life of Ridgeway where it was kind of bothering him that his wife and other people thought he was this meek little mouse, but that he had this whole double life of killing these women and feeling powerful and so forth. So he brought his wife out to the area where he was leaving bodies, right? So that, and he was making love with her there. So the idea was like, if she could only peek over the, 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 the reeds, you know, if she could only peek over, she would know what I really am, right? And um, this is important because, um, you know, with the proximity to the victims in the Horemon case, we don't know if that was related to this, this idea of this fantasy of kind of bringing everything a little bit close so that maybe it could come out, you know, that maybe he'll get busted. Maybe he'll drive to the crime scene and somebody will catch him there. Because there's this little bit of a wish that it's all going to come out. And then everyone will see what you are behind the curtain. We don't know, though, how that, that figures in. So looks like somebody's so, asking about you, my prototype you, thing. Yes. Question, yeah. Dr. Mercado. You coined the, coin, you coined the term prototype. Is it possible his mom was the original prototype? It's entirely possible. We don't know. Uh, the jury is out on that, but I could bet you there is going to be a prototype. Uh, just in case anybody wonders what that means, it simply means that in the literature, um, what people would talk about, and you heard Greg Cooper talk about this the last time he was on. Greg Cooper talked about um, how they used the term surrogate victim, right? So surrogate victim means you really want to kill this other person, but they make you feel powerless. So you go out and you kill people who remind you of the victim. And so you look at them and their commonalities and you can kind of infer what the original might have been like. And that original is the person that I called, for lack of a better term, the prototype. So the, the, so the, in this case, you know, you want to look at the victims, petite, attractive women that he saw as morally bankrupt right? In some way, that would have been the idea, calling them whores or whatever he felt about them and thinking that that he had a moral superiority over them, right? Incidentally, you saw that with Ridgway and you saw that with Gacy, right? That Gacy, in fact, would sometimes read Bible verses while killing the victims with the garrote, right? Really? So, that, so that the idea is the sense of kind of, you know, you deserve it um, because of what you did. Interestingly, by the way, with, with Gacy, 
the whole idea, I think, was that he was punishing these males because of a projection of hating his own uh, homosexuality, right? So the idea is, is you you project it onto a male that you have had sexual relations with by force, and you scream at them that they are gay, and you kill them, right? That's what what you would have been doing if you were Gacy, right? And and the idea was to to kind of trick them into killing themselves by making them uh, kind of move around in the garrote and choke. Or do you want to play a game? Do you want to see a trick? And they would say yes, and then they would die. So because he always he would always tell people that they had killed themselves in a disgusting way. And, so um, with, with with Ridgeway, the projection was just women that he considered wayward. Right. He hated women that he considered wayward. And I think that's probably what you have going on with Horamon. Whoever the prototype was, he considered a bad woman. Yeah. So and we if you're just joining us, we talked about uh, the correlation earlier uh, in the program. So you got to go watch it. If you're just here, we talked about Ridgeway, Gacy, um, BTK and of course now Horamon here. But we, Dr. Bricado, myself, and others, Greg, um, there's there there are so significant differences between BTK and what's going on here. Uh, I mean, they're huge, and and so there's really a, not a whole lot of overlay. But that's for another show. So let's answer this, Philly Knights, uh, and this is just our opinion. Uh, and of course, there are other opinions, but um, uh, I don't think there's going to be you know, a direct link uh, in terms of even behaviorally. Uh, they're, they're way different. Uh, is it too far yes. fetched to think our age could have been at the dump sites the night uh, that girl, Shannon, uh, obviously they've watched the movie uh, Lost Girls and Shannon uh, obviously be wanting one of the victims. But and of course, there was a doctor um, in the in the neighborhood there uh, that folks were throwing him uh, under the bus and thought he was uh, potentially uh, connected to some of these murders too. And we don't know yet. What we do know is DNA has put uh, this gentleman, uh, the Long Island alleged serial killer, at the scenes of some of these. And there's there's a whole bunch of other things that are correlated together. So here's a question for me. Is there a red flag uh, when men like this have locked secret rooms in their homes or separate storage lockers as well? Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, let's just say not everyone who has a private room is doing things like this, but <laughs> people like this that have secret rooms are probably doing pretty awful things in there. And um, we think, for example, of um, uh, Jerry Brudos, who was very similar to this guy in terms of where I would place him in a profile, right, with a, a kind of a low-grade torture and, and repeat, fetishistic repeat uh, sexual homicide. Um, and what he did was he had a kind of workshop, kind of garage area, and he he knew that his wife, who was kind of intrusive in his mind, um, might show up at any time or kind of pop in. And so he set up an intercom system where she had to announce herself before she could enter the secret room. Uh, and uh, and then he could hide everything. Right. I mean, and it was like equipped with things that looked normal but were being used for crime, like, for example, a mini fridge. But if you went into the mini fridge, instead of having beers or Coca-Cola in there, he had a body part, uh, a foot that he was slipping into shoes uh, for fetishistic reasons. Right. He kept a very beautiful foot, uh, what he thought was a beautiful foot. Uh, and um, or he had a paperweight that looked like an ordinary paperweight, but it had actually been made out of the breast of a victim, right? So he had all these objects around and all his instruments in his workshop. And serial killers that keep workshops are, you know, they're their own kind of breed. I mean, they're interesting, right? The David Parker Ray's uh, trailer was transformed into a $100,000 torture chamber. Uh, you know, he had, he had equipped it with everything from electrical devices used for torture, a, a coffin that people slept in by force, a gynecological chair, camera equipment, et cetera, right? And um, uh, so the idea is you have to picture somebody who, like that room is symbolically the split. That room is like the closed off, locked. It's like the id, right? It's this place where anything goes, like hell, right? And you, you kind of stick it somewhere in the basement and naughty things go on. 
you know, um, there's a. Um, How about this one before you, before, yeah. before you go off there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to make a comment and then I, yeah. I'm going to answer yeah. this. But there's yeah. a there's this really brilliant philosopher, I guess you'd call him Zizek, who talked about the movie Psycho. Remember the movie Psycho? Okay. Yep. And he said, isn't it interesting that all the terrible things Norman Bates does go on in the basement? And then there's the ground floor that people come into and they visit. And Norman, Norman looks normal. And then upstairs is where he keeps the mother that talks to him and tells him what a bad boy he is. He said, doesn't that sound like the superego, the ego, and the id? Yes. Right? The superego upstairs, the, the id is the basement where the bad things happen, and there's the ground floor. And you see the same thing here. You, you see the same thing of, like, the bad stuff goes on in the basement, you know, down below in the unconscious and and I think it down there it was like the Wild West. I mean, we don't know what went on there, and um, and I think when this guy, if he if he is found guilty, you can predict based on all the offenders like him that he'll start to unravel and he'll tell what happened and we'll start to learn. Don't be surprised if he was keeping trophies, photographs, films, etc., because this is the kind of person whose personality would make him want to relish this you don't set up a torture chamber unless you are trying to perfect a fantasy right we don't know if it was a torture chamber but it was certainly a private area right and that and that speaks to his level of organization also right so could you touch on these serial killers writing to each other bragging and such well <laughs> if the idea is domination and control um and kind of sticking it to people and fantasizing that you're the best it shouldn't shock you that these people would write to each other in a pathetic way. It's like the way that collectors write to each other. You know, I've got the bigger stamp collection, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, I caught the bigger fish. But I think that that it, there's also a pathetic loneliness to some of these people. I've gotten letters as recently as two weeks ago from serial killers who watch me on shows like this. And they write to me and they say, I never felt as understood as I did when I watched you on that interview. It sounded like you were talking about me. My first thought is always, how do you have access to this in prison? But they <laughs> apparently can watch this stuff in some places. And they get, they want to boast. They want to talk about what they did. They want me, it's like they want me to come on a show and say, you know who was really interesting? You know, that kind of thing. So so that that it's it's really about that. What do you think about them taking the doll out of the house? What do you think it meant to him? I have no doubt it meant something uh, if it was his uh, and if he, you know, I don't know if he constructed it, but I think it was a um, anatomical device that would have been used probably in some kind of fantasy um, where it may have been used for sexual purposes. It may have been a way of playing out, um, you know, child crime that he wasn't actually committing we, the reason i'm comfortable saying that is his pornography searches are suggested of someone drawn to children and um and and i think it it certainly needs to be swabbed heavily for dna or any possibility that it was being employed um in sexual acts uh let's put it that way um otherwise one really wonders why he would have had it um right so does testosterone play a role? Yes. Testosterone uh, makes someone eight times more likely to commit a violent act. Uh, and uh, so that I think that the short answer is absolutely positively. Um, yes, definitely much love. <laughs> For the Cleveland PD. <laughs> Welcome in the house. The blues in the house. Love you guys out there. Uh, here's a great one for you. How do you stay grounded? <laughs> Well, uh, I suppose you know, we... I, let, me, let me answer that one just for a second. I love this guy, as you can tell. He One, one of the things I've learned about him is you've got to keep him in the corral, though, because he's got so much up here, and he's talked oh. to these people for so long. How long have you been doing this now, by the way? Let, oh, God. Uh, since I, I started as a, as a late teenager working with the, the criminally insane, so I've had contact <laughs> with the criminally insane and, and general patients uh, for 20, about 27 years. It's going to be 27 okay. years. And Too people long. love, well, they love your passion. What I love about you, and this is what I'm going to tell our audience, if you've never, and we've got 3,100 people here right now. And by the Hello. way, so that's that's like an arena that you have you have filled these arenas many times. But mm. the, I don't know if too many people on YouTube actually understand who you are in terms of, by putting a question up and having you answer it. Mm. it. 
this is guys and gals if you've not watched um mine hunters uh remember one of the characters there is you know wendy and that wendy is um the her life on that show is based off of ann burgess and ann and gary are colleagues and they've been together f- forever uh and ann was one of the first in the BAU, the Behavior Science Unit, uh, and but they they know this stuff so well. What I have learned is I got to put the question up in front of him, or he will tell us about everything he knows about each and every one of these personalities. And for that, you know, for some of you, that may be a lot of information if you've never heard Dr. Bracado teach. And that's what this is a master class uh, whenever he's on our show. And just so take advantage of it. If you have, uh, you know, questions, you know, put them up here and I will keep putting them in front because you are 100 percent just Connie. He is a brilliant mind. And so the next question was, does this, does testosterone play a role, do you think? Yeah, no, I say it. it, it, it. Yeah, it, it makes you eight times more likely to be violent. There's no question. They, uh, and we see that we, in, 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 we see it in species other than human. Are they born this way or does something happen? Okay, so this is the this is the million dollar question, right? I mean, we, we could all win the Nobel Prize if we answered this. Um, but this is where my thinking is on this question. I think, um, and this is it's funny because I had mentioned earlier my my assistant, uh, Angela, we were just discussing this, right? We had like a full-blown debate on this very question. So I am equipped to answer this right now. Um, I think that you need two ingredients, right? One comes to us, the knowledge of, about this comes to us from um, MRI studies that are actually done of people that commit these kinds of offenses and studies that are now being done of children who have conduct issues where they sort of look like they they are in that precursor, that prodromal period potentially of going out and committing violent offenses. What we know about them is they actually have abnormalities of the brain, right? Problems with the amygdala, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe. There are things wrong with their brain. And um, what it looks like is, is that if you have that kind of brain, what then matters is, are you treated well by the world or are you not? So once you've got that kind of brain, if you are treated badly, you might take that brain and apply it in an antisocial direction. If you're treated well, you might apply it in a pro-social way. So for example, if you have a brain that makes you unafraid, sensation-seeking, extroverted, uh, um, you know, looking to do things that, that sort of show that you're not scared or that you're more powerful than other people, et cetera. If you take that and you kind of apply it in a pro-social way, you might be somebody that does things like throw themselves on a grenade and like save the whole platoon or throw yourself in front of a bullet, right? So that you wonder if those people with those kind of brains maybe were once upon a time in prehistoric times leaders, right? They were unafraid and kind of and saved everybody. But if that kind of person is abused, as the people are who commit these crimes almost invariably, Imagine taking that and turning yourself into a master predator that is going to go out and be antisocial. And I think um, the, the, what happens sometimes is you get people who don't have that kind of configuration of the brain, but they are abused. Right. And, and there you can see a kind of secondary psychopathy, like people who join gangs and things, because the idea is they can act like a psychopath, but they're not. Because what we know, for example, is that like people who get sucked into a gang or a cult, we saw this with Leslie Van Houten in the Manson situation recently. They get pulled in, they could do awful things, but as soon as they're separated from the group, they don't act like that anymore. They're not, they don't act psychopathically anymore. It's, it's done. They do it only when they're involved with a psychopath, you know? And, um, and, and those kind of people have a, have a secondary psychopathy. Some serial killers fall into that category. They were they, they probably would have been pro-social people, but they were treated so horrendously that they can act an awful lot like like somebody who's a full blown psychopath. So that's kind of how I would think about it, is you need these separate ingredients. And when you have someone where they all come together, 
it's it is about as dangerous as can be. Also, by the way, uh, I'm sure everybody knows Horiman was a very avid gun collector. And one of the things you wonder about is how those played in. And, um, you know, you, people would might be thinking, oh, was he somebody thinking about a mass shooting? Was he uh, actually guns are the most commonly used weapon in serial killers. And um, if you look at the data in male serial killers and we know those guns must have played some role. If I had to make an educated guess, that was how he would surprise and subjugate someone who came over the house for sexual purposes. Right. So uh, 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 let's say a prostitute or someone comes over and then he, he's acting like Mr. Nice Guy and then probably produced a firearm and held it to them while binding them. And then once they were under his power, kind of like a spider, you know, he's wrapped them up and brings them down to his lair. He could do whatever he wants to do. But I think those guns would have been necessary um, for that purpose. Uh, wouldn't you think, Chris? I mean, they probably figured into the MO. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a, a control method in relationship. And that's always important, you know, for everybody to understand. But when the offender goes beyond the actions necessary, you know, to perpetrate a crime, that is different than the mo what doctor's talking about that becomes signature at that point and we and that's a All whole right. nother lecture another lecture for another night but uh uh this that's is right. a great question here what's the motive for taunting the victims relentlessly is he playing out some sort of hatred hatred towards the prototype interesting question well i think what he's doing is he is um, leveling the playing field in terms of having experienced a loss himself. If you're talking about, I think what the person is asking about is the taunting of the family members of the victims. As far mm -hmm. as taunting a victim, he certainly would have done that as playing out a hatred towards women for some reason that's unclear at this time. That would have involved a prototype. But the idea would be that this is somebody who had experienced some kind of pain and wishes to hurl that onto someone else so that that person is the one who has been cheated, fooled, ridiculed, you know, controlled, manipulated, dominated, rejected, and ultimately, um, you know, hurt physically or emotionally hurt. And uh, so that, that I think that's going to turn out to be pretty key. Does, he, so does, he, like, does he like suffering? I think that's very clear. Whatever is going on with this person's personality, there's a sadistic quality. So um, if you were to look at the scale that Michael Stone devised, and then I kind of built up with him in the new evil, we, we sort of altered it to, to make it more inclusive. Um, you would see that there is a very clear point where people who have a kind of narcissistic personality spill over into being more psychopathic. And then there's a point at which they spill over into being sadistic. We see them as a, as a, as a, as a, a, a spectrum. And this is somebody who I think would have spilled over into the sadism. So that, so that I think here you, you want to imagine a person who not only through this stuff, but even in his personality would be experienced by people as having a need for control. And if he didn't get his way, he would probably condescend to you or scream at you or threaten you. For example, there's a story told about an incident where he allegedly cut a boat in half that belonged to someone because of a dispute, right? So this is not a guy who's going to say, "Oh, I'm going to I'm going to just let this go," right? He's got to do something like over the top to kind of say, "Don't mess with me. You don't know what I'm capable of," right? Like that that's the whole idea. And uh and so that I think you you want to pay attention to little incidences throughout his life, and I'm, I'm already hearing some of them, where people would have tried to approach him and he would have freaked out because he felt out of control and he would have scared you. And he was very big. So you have to imagine this guy, I think he's 6'4". I mean, imagine the 6'4 guy, you know, shouting at you because you're trying to correct him. And, um, and this is emblematized in the story he tells that he could use his worker's hammer, you know, to kind of threaten you and get you in line if you dared to have a problem with him in the workplace, right? That's him in a nutshell. The, the, yeah, he's the, coming at you. Wielding so force. this question, yeah. this is a great question. Uh, will it, I'm going to say, will it surprise you if other victims are found uh, at Gilgo Beach? I mean, we don't know that, but what do you think, Gary? My guess would be that it would be surprising if it turned out that there were as few victims as is currently being accused of, because it would make him an anomaly in the annals of crime. That based on the, the profile of this guy, you would expect earlier crimes, 
you would expect a, a, a kind of a frequency like we saw in that chart with Gary Ridgway, a kind of, you know, that whenever there's a little spike of being alone or being kind of emotionally out of control, that this would be his go to thing. And it would look a lot more like a drug addiction. Right. It would look like somebody who needed to kind of go on binges and then would do things and then kind of get back to life and then kind of. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think the uh, the people that you really want to talk to to best understand serial killing are people who really have an awareness of, of addictions. I don't mean that to suggest that there's an excuse for doing this, but they look an awful lot like people with with addictions where there's that need to, to have a higher and higher dosage uh, to to, um, to kind of excite. Right. Uh, oh, oh. Can they come? Back? No, that's yeah. me yeah. behind me. I got oh. something going off. Oh, no, we're not the, on fire. So we're still good, Mary. Oh, <laughs> there's a question that says, "Can they come off as an average soccer dad?" Yes, uh, that's the question. <laughs> yes, we got it under control. Can, uh... from the oh, okay. <laughs> I'm glad to say I'm not the only one who has technical screw-ups. But, yes, they, they, they could. What's going on here? Uh, so that question, can they come off as uh, average uh, soccer dads? I, yeah, absolutely. Yes. In, in, in the split, it's, it's perfectly possible for them not only to come across as, but to be. Uh, you remember when Dennis Rader uh, comes up, you know, his daughter, Carrie Rawson, who is a victim's advocate, has talked extensively about how even though there is a desire to paint him as someone who was, you know, from day in and day out acting in an evil way, he was loved. She loved him, right? Uh, he, he, he was, you know, th that's the whole thing, that you can be good to someone and still be this kind of person. We don't want to hear that, but it's true. And, um, and uh, so like another example, Israel Keys adored his daughter. As a matter of fact, Israel Keys um, didn't want to confess until a deal was made that his daughter wouldn't, you know, get all the details until later because he didn't want her disappointed in him, right? So that so that there, and that's because these people, what happens is there's the woman who has hurt them that gets projected onto the victims, but then there are a couple of women in their life that are the opposite, that are like the the Madonna, you know, that are on the pedestal. And those women can do no wrong, and you never want them to see <laughs> the, the truth about you, right? And you flirt with it. Would you love me anyway if you knew this? But but the whole idea is that women are fragmented. So there's the stuff you don't do with that woman, and there's the woman you do with the with the prost the, the things you do with the prostitute, right? Um, could he see uh, Gilgo Beach as the Garden of Trophies? Absolutely. Uh, as a collector, he would have um, not only compiled things but been proud of them. That is why, if he is found guilty, do not be surprised that he is going to want to boast. Uh, this this is his little collection, and uh, he wants to, you know, he's going to want to maybe eventually show it off. Uh, this is a good one here, uh, and I know you know a lot about this one. Well, this is a very complicated question because, um, the, you know, it, 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 we don't know because when you're looking at cold cases, you can only make guesses of if they're the work of the same serial killer or separate serial killers. But we do know that there are probably less of them than there were years ago. And the reason is you need to have, you know, the, the two victims, according to the current definition, separated in time by a cooling off period. And what's happening is that a lot of people are getting caught before they can kill again, Right. So that you're seeing a reduction in serial killers and an increase in mass murderers, where you kill everybody all at once in the same place. And so I have wondered if the reason for that swap in the late 90s, where there's a decline in serial killing and an increase in mass murder, is simply that you couldn't carry out these fantasies in the same way because you'd get caught. So that now you kind of have to do it all in one place at, at one time. And it's a really interesting question. My guess is, is that uh, there are probably, if I had to make an, an estimate, under 50 that would be active. They're pretty rare. And this is a huge problem because it means that most legal jurisdictions, they really have not seen one. So when you what you get a lot of times when you have this kind of murder is a, a kind of a police department that just doesn't know how to handle it. They don't know how to collect the 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 the, the um, DNA evidence. They don't know that what they're looking at is staging or posing or other things. They use the wrong words in their write-ups. They 
They, you know, they don't look for uh, signature elements. They don't understand that they should be looking for linkage to other crimes nearby, that they should go to databases to see if this is a sex offender who's got his DNA in databases. And um, Chris, I'm sure, you know, off the top of your head, you can come up with a lot of cases where there were those kind of sad screw ups because the jurisdiction had never seen anything like it before, especially years ago. Right. I mean, isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the fact that, you know, technology today has uh, increased the fuel uh, the, and they have adapted uh, quite well, right? I mean, you've been studying these guys, you know, forever. And didn't you find it interesting that he had adapted his, his behavior in relationship to uh, utilizing burner phones? Uh, just in, and then, you know, uh, that, that in of itself is a sophistication uh, for somebody who has, you know, decides to start taking people's lives uh, for something. But right. this is an interesting question here from Gina. What happens when you confront these personality types about the truth about themselves? When you've sat down with well, them? Uh, oh, God. Yeah. Well, well, before I answer that, I'll add to what you just said, that what's weird yeah. about Oyerman is, is that if you look at the accusations, on the one hand, he was using burner phones, but he was also Googling, you know, doing searches from home without much sophistication at all, right? I mean, it would have been like probably from his own house that he was looking these things up so that you, he's like kind of sophisticated, but he's also kind of half-assed in another way, right? Um, so that's methodical, but then you've got this kind of disorganized thing that seems to happen when he, when his fantasies kind of take over, where he loses uh, awareness of how visible he's going to be if he's doing that. I don't know what he thought he was doing, how he thought he was going to get away with that. Um, but regarding this question of confrontation, um, you know, it's a, it's a really good question uh, because the answer is it's very mixed. Um, most of the time when you go in and you talk to a psychopathic offender, what's going to happen is, is that they are going to have complete and total control over that conversation. And if they want you to know something, you will find it out. But otherwise, they're just going to kind of jerk with you. They, they like to tell stories that are completely made up to make themselves sound like a victim to say that the evidence was planted, that the crimes were committed by someone else, that sometimes they lie in the other direction. I've had many more victims, et cetera. And, um, you know, this is important because we have to take with a grain of salt any information that comes directly from the horse's mouth. Uh, so when you confront the person, you get two types. You get the type that loves to talk, that's a boaster, that's going to say, let me give you all the juicy details. And even that, those are going to be mixed with lies, probably. And then you get the type that's going to, till the day they die, tell you that they had nothing to do with it. Uh, and, um, you know, for example, I had a letter uh, before he died. I think he recently died. I had a letter from Charles Albright, the serial killer who was obsessed with removing the eyeballs of women that he had killed. Because <laughs> as a child, his mother had uh, been obsessed with taxidermy. And, and he was always surrounded by those eyes that were put into taxidermied animals. And so he had this thing with keeping the eyeballs, right? And um, I have a long letter from him where he comes up with this elaborate explanation about um, <laughs> he's looking at his wife like, dear God. But, but, uh, 30, but stuff from him. 3,300 people here. Okay, guys, yeah. this is why we love Dr. Percato. Did you just hear what he said? He just, he went from, oh, by the way, I got to tell you about a guy who collects, you know, yeah. these. The, Sorry. Well, and but, by the uh, way, this, this is also important for us. We're not laughing at any of the, no. the, the victimology. Or anything. This is also a way of saying, you know, been there, done that. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, that's it. Uh, good release. It's a good release. Go ahead. <laughs> it's a good release. But, but the idea is that, that Albright came up with in this letter an extremely elaborate, ridiculous explanation for why, you know, how it wasn't him. How he was framed. Oh, it was all fake. And, and, and um, you know, so, yeah, right. I love that. Uh, yeah. So, so that's so funny. But, but uh, so, so the idea is you get that type and you get the boaster, right? And, uh, you know, BTK falls more into the boaster kind of category, right? The type that would almost be irritated if someone else was getting the spotlight, right? And, you know, so we don't know where Hoyman's going to fall, but if I had to predict, he's the type that's going to deny it first and then talk. Uh, if he's guilty. 
Uh, so, uh, so th there's my answer to that is I think they just, um, it, there's a mixed bag. I also think you should pay attention to the lies that serial killers tell because their lies are accidental admissions. The, the, it's sort of like if you do a Rorschach or something, you've got to use what you've got when you lie, right? You're going to project into the lie. And so what you get is like, for example, the person might tell a made up story about how they were misunderstood and victimized. And that's why they were made to look guilty when they didn't do it. But the truth of the story is that they were victimized and misunderstood. That part's true, but they twisted it into a phony innocence story. Right. So you want to be you know, you want to notice that when you interview these kind of people that they tell you the truth in drips and drabs and they transform it into a lie. That that's the idea. Um, so uh, that so girl. See. Next question. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a comment too. That and she's interested in your thought process on uh, if he began before the internet and major technology use evolved with technology. Uh, lots of study there. Yes. Yes, especially because technology figures in so much with Hoyerman. The 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 you get the feeling that uh, well, like for example. When you look at a serial killer or accused serial killer, you want to look at what is the expression of of I am smarter than you. I am better than you. For most of them, it's sex, the use of sex and, and, and torture to to demonstrate domination and control over another person. Right. But there are other ways that they do it. There are serial killers, for example, that use the press or use the anonymity of, of hiding behind the letters that they're sending to law enforcement or to the families of victims or whatever to have that feeling of domination and manipulation control and um so the uh you know i i think with this kind of a guy what you want to think about is somebody that was using technology that way i'm smarter than you technically and um you see that in the use of probably um architecture to feel a kind of grandiose sense of of strength and and power and um uh, the use of the burner phones, the use of uh, the internet to get pictures and information on people, calling people to ridicule them, etc. This all required technology, which is precisely why this is a decidedly modern offender, right? If you look at the new evil, the book I did with Michael Stone, one of my points of new evil, one of the subtypes of new evil is that it couldn't have happened a long time ago because the technology didn't exist. So I'm interested in crimes that are born of technology, right? The minute a yeah. technology comes out, you use it. And um, yeah, so yeah. like, for example, if you said to me, who was the first serial killer to use Polaroid photography? I would say Harvey Glotman, right? Like I, I know who the offender is that first used it, right? Because I study that. And um, so that you come up with a device and we'll tell you who the first person was to do it. And I, I think that's a very clever point the person made. This guy would have been very different before the internet and before some of this modern technology. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys, I, you're all is, here from all around, all around the world, uh, 3,400 people of uh, here now, and it keeps growing. And I can imagine, hopefully, if you're sharing this out on your social networks, as you can tell, uh, Dr. Bracado is just, again, I, I cannot keep saying this, but it's true. He is one of the most amazing uh, minds uh, in this arena for many, many years. And if you've not had a chance to get his book, uh, the link is below. Get down there, read his book. Uh, he has some really, really interesting uh, things in there. Uh, and I think it would will blow your mind. Here's an interesting question from Mimi. He says, have there ever been any research done on the partner or wives of, uh, uh, or husbands of serial killers uh, in relationship to similarities? There is. There are some people who have looked at that. i um, not sure if they published it, but I've certainly talked to colleagues about it. I think it's a difficult topic because it, if you think about it, it smacks of victim blaming. Uh, to say, um, you know, there's a certain type of person who becomes involved with an offender and doesn't know what they're up to and lets themselves potentially be victimized and so forth. So I think we want to be very careful with it. But I but I think the idea is that um, what is more interesting to researchers is um, uh, partners who are aware of what their 
partner is doing and get it involved in some way. And in those offenders uh, who take on a partner, what you typically see is a very, very psychopathic, sadistic, ferocious male, almost always, and a female partner who is terrified or aroused, one or the other. So you get the the type that plays along because they think they're going to be the victim. Like in the case of Cameron Hooker, the, the uh, torturer um, whose wife was aware that he had picked up Colleen Stan. If you ever want to read, uh, th that case is in the New Evil, but that was the, the famous case where they picked up a, a hitchhiker and kept her in a box 23 hours a day for years. Um, and the wife was aware of her being taken out of the box for torture. But then she eventually turned on him and, and she, she didn't want to have anything to do with it anymore. She became a victim's rights advocate under an assumed name. But then you get the other type, like the Carla Homolka type, Paul Bernardo's uh, girlfriend, right, who was aroused by him. And what's interesting there is if you talk to offenders who have that kind of partner, they'll tell you how they find the partner, right? Like Paul Bernardo said that he would go out to a bar and he would make inappropriate jokes to the women at the bar and he would look to see who smiled and got aroused by an inappropriate question. Mm. Most of them would get horrified and one of them would get a little smile and he'd say, that's the one she'd be willing to do this stuff with me. And so then he would groom, he groomed Carla Homolka to be so willing to participate in his crimes that their victim together was her own sister. Right. Mm. And, uh, and, uh, and, and in fact, uh, what he even got her to do, was to take a picture of the two of them waving sadistically and they tucked it into the pocket of the sister so that when she was disinterred during the course of a police investigation, they pulled out the picture and saw Bernardo and his girlfriend waving sadistically that they had done it. Wow. Right. So you get that kind of offender. So, so, but, but, but that, but as far as like the kind of person who marries a serial killer or dates one, we don't know that much about them, but we do about the ones who participate. Uh, um, and yes, she is out of jail, so corona. maybe I need to get a helmet, you know, because she's out <laughs> and I'm talking about it. Yeah, and uh, I want to get back to that other question. Well, technology has, has do you think technology has played a role where they're starting to think a little bit more about, uh, you know, not getting, a, not getting found and arrested? Yes, but, but there's a, there's a um, counter attack from law okay. enforcement. So like, what for example, the technology would be that of DNA technology, the, the, the offender has to outpace it. So like, for example, you, we have noticed, Ann and I uh, have been, and Victor Petreca, Ann Burgess, Victor Petreca and I have been looking at dismemberment mutilation. And we found that that used to be thought of as a pretty disorganized thing to do, to like kind of butcher a body and whatever. But we're realizing that it's done to get rid of evidence more and more. You're seeing more of it. And in fact, what I'm seeing is that now you're seeing even more burning of a body to get oh rid of every drop of it. Now, why is that? Because the victim, the killers are trying to outpace the DNA technology. Right. And so what happens is in, in a lot of cases, you see this kind of yin yang cat and mouse thing where the use of technology winds up coming back around and being why you get caught. Right. So like Kohlberger was very technologically savvy. Right. But it's DNA technology that winds up coming around and capturing him. So you you take advantage of the the, the latest thing and you get caught by the latest thing, right? And um, so there's a there's an outpacing. Simple example of that I mentioned Israel Keys earlier. The most infamous thing that Israel Keys did was take a photo of a deceased woman that was made up to look alive, so that he could send it to her family for a ransom, but she was already dead. And um, what happened was he wound up getting caught because of, of photography. He wound up getting caught because he was going to ATMs and the, the ATM would take a picture of you. It would, it would, you'd be on camera. So the very thing that he used for his infamy winds up catching him. So I'm fascinated by that interplay. And, um, you know, it's this kind of thing where you, it's like a, like an arms race where you have to keep you know, and I don't mean to make a pun that I was talking about dismemberment, but there's like an arms race where you're you're, you're kind of trying to outpace, right? And um, so now I love this question. Uh, may, I, may shall I answer, Texas lady here? Yes, um, please. I, I love that. I love that question. So the answer is, um, 
if you look at historical cases, it's it's probable that sexual sadism existed always. Uh, we know that there were infamous people all throughout history who were cruel sexually, including Roman emperors and certain historical figures. But to kill as an expression of sexual sadism is a pretty modern phenomenon. So what you start to see is even during the many years that newspapers existed and there was full reporting, that there's a slow trickle of these kind of serial killers that kill sexually really from the late 19th century and the Jack the Ripper era and, you know, the, the H.H. H. Holmes kind of type. And you start moving more and more until you get to the 60s. And then all of a sudden in the 1960s, there's an explosion of serial sexual homicide. And that is when people like Anne were asked to go to the FBI in the 70s and try to explain it. And the way that Anne and I got together is when I was doing the research that led to the new evil, I was talking to her about why that might be. And the hypothesis that Michael Stone and I put forward is that it had to do with men, certain men being incapable of tolerating the freedoms that women were gaining in the 1960s. Now, that is not intended to be a victim blaming. Anytime I say this, there's always that person who misinterprets it and thinks that what's being said is that women are being blamed for their freedom. That is not what we're saying. We're simply saying that certain brittle psychopathic men took it upon themselves to avenge the freedoms that women were receiving at that time. And, uh, and so you start to see this thing of going out and sort of taking women by force that now had a right to reject you in, in a society that had been very patriarchal previously. And um, and so we, we have to sort of think about how that plays in. It's very interesting to think about that. But it was right at that time, the, the 1960s. And then from the 60s to the 90s is the period that is called the so-called golden age of serial killing, because it's right sandwiched between that epoch of, of what happened in the 60s and the technology arising in the late 90s that starts to make serial killing harder to do without getting caught. So that that's the, the those are the two bookends. And between them, you see this kind of stuff. So um, and you always want to look at these offenders. Uh, and like and it's fast. It's fascinating later. that, that yeah. Anne was a pioneer, was a pioneer. In, oh, that, yeah. in, in that game there. Do you think uh, his uh, sadistic behavior was his downfall? Do you think that's what I think, uh, the, uh, I think the downfall would be the pride. The downfall would be the I need to insinuate myself the, the you know, I need to kind of uh, really get in there and kind of look at the investigation, Google search, uh, et cetera. But I also think that what's very suspicious is that, you know, the, there's this thing of leaving hair um, on the victims. And we don't know how that happened. But there is that kind of sloppiness of having these victims somewhere where they'd be exposed to that, whether, you know, because it's like the wife's hair. So is it in the house somewhere? Is, you know, is it his own hair? So there's this idea that maybe he wasn't gloved or something. But you get some idea of him kind of getting cocky and getting sloppy and that playing in because he, you know, leaving hair, that's uh, pretty dumb. That's a big uh, deal. You know, a big deal. Do you think his pride uh, played into yes. it? Obviously. Yes, yeah. I do. I think his that's pride a, was his downfall. Yes, it usually a, is. That's a great question. Uh, so there's a question about, and by the way, you know, we don't know anything about his brother other than, you know, what people talk about, you know, out there on the internet. So until we know more about the brother, I really don't want to uh, put up questions right. about the brother. So if you've, if you have made a comment about it, it's not that I don't want to put it up. We just don't know yet. And he could be 100%, uh, you know, not involved in this. Or he could, you know, we don't know. So let's not go there tonight just yet. Uh, let's wait till we get a little bit more. Uh, what about the taunting of the victims' families when he was calling uh, the families, you know, right. allegedly? What, what, Where's that coming from? Well, I, I, as I, I mentioned earlier, I, I think it has to do with a, a kind of a, an envy of people who had intact families and then he took someone from them. Right. So the idea is now, you know what it feels like to be deprived of a loved one, because I think I really do think that's what happened to him. I think the death of his father was catastrophic. And so there's this kind of thing of, of, of saying like, na 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 you know, you, a, a really good example of this is Albert Fish, the infamous uh, cannibal and serial killer who was both psychotic and psychopathic. 
he was um, fetishistically obsessed with sending letters and making phone calls to victims' families and saying what he had done to victims. But there, again, you had somebody who had been abandoned and was in an orphanage and, and did not have uh, loved ones. You know, it was a sort of idea of, um, you know, kind of taking someone away from someone and now being the parental figure that causes a separation instead of being the victim of a separation. And, uh, and, and I think that's it has something to do with that, that cruelty. And, and of course, you know, you could just be a sadistic person that's amused uh, by doing that. There are very few cases, Chris, you could really write an interesting study of serial killers that are willing to do this because you would have to insinuate yourself in a very dangerous way where you're making a direct contact with the victim's family. Um, Larry Jean Bell certainly comes to mind. Albert Fish, the, the Meyerhofer case, which was mentioned by Anne in the, in the last time we were on. Um, but there aren't many. It's, it's a very unusual crime. And we don't know if this had a fetishistic purpose, if it was a kind of a signature thing, if it aroused him, if it would lead to sexual excitement, it certainly did for Albert Fish. Um, uh, or, and we don't, or we don't know if it, if it was part of this leveling the playing field revenge fantasy thing. So it was some kind of fantasy. We don't know if it was sexually arousing or if it was just cruel, um, going back to that little kid stuff that he dealt with that was being sorted out. Uh, but it was very foolish. It, it could have easily led to getting in trouble. Uh, so, so again, you have that flirting with being a little too close to home and getting a little sloppy. Interesting. Uh, do you think Keyes gave up? It seemed he did the ATM card on purpose after the proximate event of Family Cruise. No, I don't think so. I, I never thought that. I think that, that Israel Keyes was a deeply arrogant individual who thought that he was going to go forever. Uh, uh, it is true that the the murder that um, that led to his capture, uh, where he took the woman from the coffee kiosk in Alaska, and, um, you know, kept her for a while, killed her by strangulation and then made the body look alive for ransom photo that I, I think that was just very bold and over <laughs> the top. Um, you would have to go into the realm of the Freudian to kind of interpret it, that his goal was to get captured because he was sick of it, kind of like a werewolf that's tired of killing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, please kill me, that kind of thing. But but I, I think he just was so over the top at that point that he got sloppy Bundy style, you know, where you. You've kind of lost uh, the organizational level because you're getting too cocky. Uh, you see that also with Ramirez and certain other offenders where you start out a little more neat and it just you get cocky because you, you think you're getting away with it. And uh, you don't realize the police are trailing you or, or on to you. Um, OK, so I've had you an hour and 45 minutes where no, we got more questions. Almost almost done. Uh, and I mean. Unless you've got more time, all night. Uh, I mean, we could go for. I go. You're all right until nine o'clock, Chris. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, I'm fine. Absolutely, nine? we'll go. We'll run. We'll run. Uh, okay. Yeah, let's go to nine. If if that works for you, Doc. I always want to be sure you know uh, sensitive to your schedule. So, um, Mel, I, I, I have Dr. Bricado, do serial killers ever? Oh, finish. Yep. You're, you're blipping, Chris, so I'm not hearing if you're talking. You're kind of freezing. You, you were freezing there, so I don't know if you that were talking. That question. Okay. So, so, um, yeah, yeah, and, I, and I want to mention, mm -hmm. I didn't answer a question from earlier. I don't know if you want me to revisit it, but but this one that says, yeah. does serial killers ever confide in others? So um, there's an interesting question. When Sometimes when you have serial killers that, that operate in pairs, Obviously, they have to confide in one another, you know, the, the Henry Lee Lucas, Otis Tool kind of style thing, where there's the intimacy of the two people killing together. Sometimes you, you get serial killers that hint to other people that, you know, they are engaged in certain activity. But most of them are pretty solitary and private. You do see some boasting in jail where sometimes offenders will boast to a jailmate or something, and then the jailmate will will go out and kind of tell people what the what the jailmate said um and um like for example in the manson family it was when susan atkins was incarcerated that she was boasting to a cellmate that the cellmate made a phone call and reported what susan atkins had said and that's how they cracked what the heck would had really happened there with the manson family she was boasting and um and uh we we see this like simple example 
No one knows what happened to Ott and Naslin, the double homicide at Lake Sam when uh, Ted Bundy picked up the two women at the same time. But uh, Bundy shared a cell with, um, I think, Schaefer, the, uh, the, the sexually sadistic serial killer. And they were kind of boasting to each other. And according to Schaefer, George Schaefer, um, he told him the story of what had happened which I won't share here because it's just deeply disturbing, but supposedly shared that story so that the only hint we have of what happened to those two comes from someone who could just be making it up, but who was supposedly told it by his cellmate. So there is, I think once there's incarceration, there can be some boasting and, uh, and sharing. And certainly there can be confiding uh, with other people like um, a, a person who befriends a serial killer or writes to them or so forth. And sometimes they write to each other. Um, but, but I think when they're on the outside, they tend to be deeply private and you wouldn't expect too much chatting with other people. Um, they, they might boast anonymously, like writing a letter like Zodiac did or something where you, you write to the press or something, but you wouldn't give your name. Telltale signs when they're younger. Yeah. So, um, the vast majority of people who commit serial sexual homicide, the most common type of serial killing, the vast majority of them have had horrendous um, childhoods. Most of them have been physically or sexually abused, um, or there was incredible instability in the home or a broken home. Uh, this is another thing that comes up when people talk about why the 1960s spawned this whole generation and change of serial killers is there were very big changes to the home lives of people at that time. Um, but that gets into a very controversial kind of stuff. Uh, but but the idea is, is that they do tend to come from broken, unpredictable environments where they don't have very good attachments. Uh, and um, there are a couple of exceptions. Some people say BTK is an exception. Some people say Bundy, where you can't quite put your finger on something like that. But most of them have had that. Now, there is that famous uh, triad, you know, animal killing, fire starting, uh, bedwetting that supposedly is a precursor. What the studies show when they do meta-analysis of that to see if it works, what they find is it only works when you have two of them or more. So if you are a bedwetter who tortures animals, that is predictive, but being a bedwetter or an animal torturer alone is not. You need two or more on the triad. OK, so a, there is a little bit a little bit of a predictiveness. I also think that the other predictor is um, that at puberty, there is the expression of anger through sex uh, or fantasies related to sex that very predictably proceeds. I once talked to an offender, a sex offender in prison who told me that he was at the window. He went he was going to the window of somebody where he was going to peep. And he found that somebody had thrown out into the garbage a stack of magazines. And one of the magazines was uh, like a Playboy or something. And the other one was a detective magazine that had on the cover um, a woman having like a knife pressed to her throat. And he took the detective magazine home to masturbate, not the Playboy. And um, that's the kind of stuff that you see in the in the adolescence and young adulthood, these kind of offenders. The arousal comes from the subjugation and, and abuse of women. Which is the, an interesting uh, point, yeah. uh, like with Goldberger, when when you talked about his personality type before they caught him, explain to the audience why it is so important for even investigators to pay attention to the pre-incident behaviors, you know, that have, you know, this uh, sexual quality, uh, peeping Tom, that kind of stuff. A explain why that becomes so critical and how can it connect to further behavior, uh, you know, during the commission yeah. of these crimes? Because if we understand sex as the, the medium through which offenders uh, express the need for domination, manipulation, and control. And we understand that it progresses by a gradual breakdown of the breaking system of the brain, like a drug addict, you know, drug addicted person would show. You have to start out small and then your will and your comfort increase. So what you start out with is an expression of that through things like peeping, 
or looking at violent fantasies, uh, you know, uh, uh, depicted in magazines or in porn or whatever. And then it needs to kind of slowly build. So you're a little nasty to a woman in the street. You know, you're, you're a little bit um, cruel with a prostitute. You, you know, you take a woman out on a date and you get a little too grabby or violent or there's choking or something like that. You start playing it out with your romantic part. And then there's a building, a building, a building. So like, you know, you start to see things like, you know, um, breaking into the house of a person and just sort of standing there, looking at them in bed, you know, getting comfortable in their house, taking their underwear out of the drawer, taking snapshots of a sleeping person, looking through the window and masturbating, uh, you know, uh, it's all that kind of stuff. And then it builds until you've built up the comfort to go a step further. And sometimes that's by accident. Sometimes you, you're engaging in some rough play with a victim, you know, what you think is rough play, they think is torture. And and the and the victim dies and you're and you're angry because you didn't expect it. And then it's a thrill. So you start killing, you know, or it could be that you set out to kill, that that was always the purpose from the get-go, right? And um, so that so that it there's a kind of a building, a building, because it's not enough anymore to just look at the porn. And then it's not enough to peep. It's not exciting anymore. And then it's not enough to strangle. It's not enough, to, you know. And it builds and builds and builds until the person has to increase the, the the rate of killing, and it becomes almost mechanical. Look at the similarities in how the victims were killed in the Hormon case. Does a person uh, develop that kind of mo so perfectly? If that's their first offense, chances are that you've built up to it. There's going to be a period of of offending that comes before in other forms, other kinds of antisocial behavior, other kinds of sadism, other kinds of sexual offenses, and then those kinds of offenses. But we don't know about that stuff yet. It may never emerge, but it'd be pretty surprising if it doesn't. Yeah. No, and how about family members? It, you know, the circle of family members that they're able to compartment, the, the, the offenders able to, or the suspects able to compartmentalize it so well uh, to those around them, um, how to? Yeah. What's the, what's the psychology behind how they're able to do that? Well, the the idea is is that, and, and this gets to a point that I I bring up often, and some of the viewers have heard me say this before, but a lot of them have not. There are a lot of new names here, I'm seeing yeah. in the live stream, you know. And um, so what I'll say very quickly is that you have to remember that it is not true that these people don't have empathy they have an ability to read other people and to pick up on when they are sad or scared or angry or whatever and they know most of the time how to at least a little bit charm them and to manipulate them and win them over whatever but what they lack is compassion they they use the empathy to manipulate you and then they kill you they pull out the lack of compassion you have to understand that so that it doesn't shock you that these people have the capacity to have loving relationships with other people. But, but what there's, what's going on is, is like where psychologically you, you, you may idealize certain people and consider them predictable, loving objects that are different than the people who were terrible to you that you would never want to soil or sully or hurt in any way. Or it may be that you're simply very good at lying to them. I mean, like in the case of Gacy, right? He was just a master BS artist who, you know, who knew how to do this stuff. And I mean, he had a lie for everything. People would come over the house and they'd say, why does the house smell? Because there were bodies under the, you know, <laughs> and he would say the sewer backed up, you know, without even missing a beat. Sewer backed up. Guess I'll have to go down there and work on it. You know, everything was a, was a cover story, right? And, um, you know, but so that, that for most of them, I think it's a kind of a BS thing, but they know how to manipulate your empathy. And then for some of them, it's, a, it's that split, that idealization versus the devaluing. So you would never, ever, ever do to the wife what you would do to the prostitute that you've got, you know, in the, in the soundproof room. The, the two. And that's the fascinating thing is symbolically, that's why you don't want them in the room. It's, it's not you're going to discover me. It's more like that room's for the bad women. You don't oh, go in there, right? You don't go in there. You go in our bedroom. The bad, the bad woman goes there, and the good woman goes there. That that that's a, it's like a compartmentalization, like a collector would do. You're in this category, not that category. You're that kind of bird, not this kind of bird. So that that it's a collecting thing. That's how you got to understand it.
Right. Those women. Right. Exactly like this person said, that Sarah says. Interesting. That is a fascinating uh, observation. Uh, that, and so I have a question. This is my question. Yeah. All right. So walk me through Boy. the game. Uh, he's got him on the hook. He gets him there. What it, What do they see when they first see? I mean, you and I both know how it works on the street, okay? And we know how it gets there. And get, by the way, if you're new here, please get Doctor Bricado's book. It's down below. He he is, by the way, the number one bestseller uh, on uh, Amazon uh, in his category about this stuff. And it, the links are below. Uh, you will not uh, regret it. In fact, you will thank me on the next show. Trust me. And those of you. Sure. I'll be disturbed, but I'll learn a lot. Yeah. Those of you who've gotten the book already, and I see uh, Vet Girl got one, um, you know, show us in the in the chat that you've you've read his book. But anyway, here's where I was going. The hookup is made, you know, the connections made. They're in the car, or you know, they're at the meetup spot. Um, mm -hmm. How do you think this guy plays? Well, I, I think that part of the sadism is the shock that I'm not what you thought I was, right? So so that moment is going to be part of the, now you're under my control, right? So I think that's going to happen wherever the private place is that he takes them, right? So we get two kinds of offenders of the organized type. You get the type that's going to immediately, they're going to give you a BS story to lure you because they're very charming and they could get you to go willingly somewhere. And then they bop you, blitz you, like Bundy would do. So Bundy would would convince, you know, a, a woman to go with him, a young woman to go with him. Oh, you're so, you know, I could really use your help. Oh, you're, you're attractive, whatever he would say. And, and he could lure you and he would bop you, blitz you, and then take you to some private area. This is the kind of guy that's a little weird. So I don't think he would have been very charming like that. He would have had to get somebody, let's say, on the Internet or in some way a prostitute, somebody who was going to pay. And uh, sort of like... Um, uh, like like you would see in Hanson, you know, in Hanson out in uh, in Alaska, where he would hunt the women in the forest. He was right. picking up sex workers, prostitutes. He couldn't he couldn't get anybody to go with him. He had to hurt. He had to do this similar thing where he would he would kind of lure you, uh, telling you he was going to pay you, and then he would do this. So so I think that he gets them to come to him to the place that secret secreted away where he's place where he's going to do whatever he's going to do, and then the gun comes out or something. And you have to imagine that the minute they saw him, they probably would have been a little afraid of how big he was, right? A little frightened by that. But he would have done a sweet talk routine. Oh, how old are you? You know, how'd you get into this business? Oh, this is it. We're going to go back to my house. My wife is away, blah, 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 blah. And they'd go there and they would go compliantly because we don't have any evidence of anything like a woman leaping out of a car terrified. Uh, you know, those kinds of things that you start to see with the kind of offender that snatches you right there. So he probably gets them, you know, to the house or they show up at the house because he's commissioned them, so to speak. And and so now they're in some kind of private place. And then he's going to brandish a gun. He's going to pull something out, scare the, the heck out of them and bring them to some super isolated place. So now the door closes or whatever this place is. And you can just imagine the mask falls off. And now he tells them, you know you stupid this that and the other thing you you idiot you moron you know you know that kind of thing and now he's binding them and you have this woman who's screaming on the top of her lungs who is just sort of laying there or suspended in some way and now he is going to do whatever he wants to do for a period of time and with those kind of offenders it is very extended they they are going to toy with you because you have to understand this is like the teenager whose parents have gone away you know, and you could have a party, you know, he's going to get, he's going loose, letting loose. The symbolism, of course, of the wife going away is the superego is gone. When the cat's away, you know, the mice will play, right? So she's gone and now he could, it's risky business, you know, he could do whatever he wants. So, so you have to picture somebody who's going to relish that he has control over that house. He's the parent. I'm in charge. Uh, everything I want goes. So in that moment, you have to imagine somebody who's going to really play this stuff out. And he would have wanted the person to beg for their life. He would have wanted the person to, you know, have certain to, to right. perform certain sexual acts. He would have perhaps wanted them to say certain things that are very scripted in his head. And he would have wanted to be the arbiter of when they died. You There's know, nothing that causes that kind of offender more than you dying on them. One they of the 
alive as long as they want you alive. Yeah. One of the shows that we talked about a while ago, you said that people have reported, and I've seen it in in uh, killers that I've talked to, their mm -hmm. eyes, uh, they just, they just, there's just something not there. It just changes like left and right. Can, do you right. think he obviously, you know, he lures them in and then there's that transfer of aggression, right? With that, yeah. that's what we call it, right? right? He's going to, he's going to turn into the, 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 the Mr. Hyde. Right. And, and he's got, he's on the hunt. He gets these obviously vulnerable uh, sex workers. And unfortunately they have no idea what's on the other side of that uh, phone call. I mean, they've, and that's they've part of the there. fun for him. That's part of the pleasure for him. Exactly. Because hiding on the other end of that phone is part of the, of that, darkness thing that we talked about like in the Koberger case what he's accused of so there's something about that hiding behind and um you know that thing of the eyes i mean i think what people are talking about is when somebody is pumping with adrenaline and they're totally enraged you're seeing that kind of like wide pupiled you know you can look almost like a, a person on a drug uh where they're in a frenzy right like a dopaminergic soup and and it's all kind of coming out because at the end of the day this is not really about sexual arousal. It's about awakening a beast that's in you, that's enraged at women. And incidentally, before anybody points it out, I'm waiting for the comment. I, I, it always comes. Yes, there are offenders that target males. There are there are um, male serial sexual homicide perpetrators that are that identify as gay or bi that will go out and target males like Dahmer, right, and and other people. But they are the vast majority of them are um, heterosexual males that are targeting women. Uh, and um, but but um, but but I think, yeah, Chris, what you're going to see is that the mask falls off and now they're ferocious. Yes. And Definitely. and does it be as Jen asked, does it become a, addictive in nature like you were talking about earlier? It's almost like a, a building block. Right. And yeah, it, it follows an addiction model. There's no question about it with the with the need for a greater and greater dosage and the need for excitement. But I, the reason I, I get a little hesitant to talk about that is because it almost seems to suggest that they're sick in a way like that. They have an excuse like doc, I couldn't help it. I'm addicted, you know, so I just need to be, you know, to go into remission and I'll never do it again. It's more like the getting addicted to like dopamine, you know, like the way that somebody might get hooked on gambling or something like that. It's a thrill that, that, that you get hooked on, but, these people certainly know what they're doing. They want to get revved up like that. That's the whole idea. So interesting. Hello, yin yang. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, and by the way, Dr. Bercato will be back. We've got, he's got so many great things. Uh, and he's doing a lot too of much. amazing stuff. We don't want to talk too much about what you guys are doing because it's top secret, a lot of the things you do. But that's true. Uh, uh, but there are amazing things happening. Uh, you will see uh, one day uh, soon coming. But that said, okay, you get the last word, Dr. Bricado. And before we go to Hawaii here, I want to thank everybody uh, that's been on the show tonight, uh, that's been with us tonight. We've got 3,400 people in here right now. Uh, we will have um, an opportunity. And maybe, maybe we could do a book giveaway, Gary, with a – with your um, signature that oh, sure. you, you could send me a copy and we'll figure out how to do a book giveaway one, one night. And uh, I would but, love that. Yeah. And those of you uh, who uh, have not had a chance to, to see his work, uh, please get down to the link and check it out. And you can read his short bio <laughs> as well down there. But more importantly, uh, the, the gentleman over here, is a is an amazing human being and i know that people have asked you know how do you shut your mind off you know doc you know and uh as teresa says we thank you for being here it's been an amazing chat each and every one of you but because of guys like dr bricado guys like this gentleman in new york and many others are caught I believe there's opposites in all thing and I uh, in all things and I believe that 
evil is balanced by good. And if you haven't noticed, uh, this fantastic um, doctor here is that balance. Uh, and in a thousand percent, you know, there are good guys and there are bad guys. And then there are evil. There are pure, there, there's evil and pure evil. And I know uh, Dr. Stone, did I ever tell you I had to follow him after a lecture? in wisconsin oh my god i'm terribly sorry he he that it, is like impossible because he is brilliant i mean it was I, a homicide I would, I would conference to. and then i was i don't know how it happened but whoever put it together i i was talking about you know children dead children and he had just lectured before me and of course you know i felt like and now you know here comes pretzel boy <laughs> and i was like Oh my gosh, that was Dr. Stone. What am I doing here? And uh, anyway, the the uh, the event organizer apologized to me later. I said, no problem. You know, they all went for lunch, I'm sure, by the time I got up there. Uh, but it don't, was a don't, very... Don't small... knock yourself, Chris. That Don't <laughs> knock yourself. You make a lot of important contributions. We, I wouldn't be here talking to you if I didn't have the utmost respect for, for what well, you you're, you're an amazing human being, and I appreciate that. So... You get the last word, and everybody, thank you so much for being here tonight uh, to listening uh, to this great mind and, and the correlations. If you if you came in late, get to the front part of this. We talked about a lot of correlations, so uh, I'm ready to go to Hawaii. So, Dr. Picado, you've got the last word. Okay. Well, um, first of all, um, I noticed that a lot of people were asking the question, you know, how do you keep yourself from going cuckoo dealing with this stuff and i think the answer is it has to lo a lot to do with making a meaning out of it that that you're you you see yourself sort of like you know the way that a, a physician or surgeon or something would have to deal with the gore and the terrible stuff that they're saying because it's necessary to preserve life and and that's kind of how i see it that somebody has to do this stuff I mean, you've got to you've got to understand the phenomenology uh, the internal experience of people who do these things in order to predict other people doing it and therefore prevent. And um, so I think it's necessary. And, and and I think you have to engage in a kind of compartmentalization yourself where you kind of block it out and you could do it in all kinds of ways. I mean, in my own case, I have, you know, friends and family and a lot of hobbies and I'm an enormous film buff. I'm a musician, a composer, a writer, a painter. And um, and those things kind of allow me a, a place to go where I can remember that uh, the world is in many ways a, a very beautiful place. Um, you, I think you start to realize that um, in every moment of life, you could look through a lens of seeing the awful or you could look through a lens of seeing the good. Uh, as uh, Robert Louis Stevenson said, two men looked out through prison bars. One saw mud, the other stars. And uh, I like to be somebody who who keeps my head in in, in the stars. Um, regarding the last word, I would say, as always, uh, there are two things. One is let's remember that Rex Horiman is uh, innocent until proven guilty, and uh, and I think, uh, and, and that goes also for Kohlberger and other people that that have been mentioned as suspects during the show. And I think. The, our attention really should go to the victims. I think we should pause and kind of think about these poor women. And the um, there's also a, a trans male who may or may not be connected to Herman, who was, who was found deceased. Um, I think we have to think about those individuals and remember that they should be in our hearts more than trying to chat about the offender. Um, let's remember that, indeed, there are families that are torn apart. And, and even though these are people who... Um, the offender might have thought of as trash. Um, they had people who loved them uh, and um, they were just sort of plucked out of the world because of somebody's perverse fantasies. And that could have been anyone we love, anyone. So let's remember that. And um, in the meantime, off we go to Hawaii. And thank you, Chris, for another wonderful uh, invitation. Hard working every day, I'm stressed out 24-7, babe, no, no timeouts Wish we could fly away, you and I Go to our favorite place, oh yeah, yeah Make special memories, together
Taking away, yeah, we're taking away. We'll never come down. 